Hi everyone, Ray again. Today I am at the Hagley Museum taking a tour of the 1870s machine shop. This machine shop supported the DuPont Gunpowder Factory. Yes, the uh, DuPont used to make gunpowder uh, off of the Brandywine River, which is the river you see here to the left. And to power the machine shop, which kept the operation running, uh, they used the power of the river, and uh, it was quite amazing. I'm going to let the tour guide explain the entire workings of the machine shop. Transferred by this hemp rope from the turbine to the outside of the machine shop. You see like there's a rod there that goes into the shop. Walk inside. Okay, uh, that rod is called a shaft, and it turns this wheel here. And then the uh, power is being transferred by that leather belt up here to our main shaft that runs the length of the room here. So if I uh, pull this lever here, okay, that starts up our main shaft that runs the length of the room. Now you see these leather belts running from the main shaft to each machine that can be run in the shop here. Okay, let's walk down a little bit. These uh, belts are loops. Uh, they're tied together with leather lacings. This is like the weak point. Uh, the lacings break, so they just relace it. Uh, most of these machines have four speeds right here. Uh, set it to slow speed and it can be moved down the wheels to increase the speed as well as up there you'll increase it as well if you move to the left. Uh, this particular machine has two belts going through it. One is twisted and that gives it the function of going in reverse motion and then the forward belt there, forward motion. Uh, these machines you're looking at are the 1870 era. They were built in New England by machine shops up there for the textile industry uh, that flourished in New England in the, uh, in the early 1800s. And that's where DuPont bought the machine for the shop. So, uh, shafts were used like above. If you walk down here, you might have noticed them going up the side of the hill. Can you see that? It had a gear, then you have an 18-foot shaft, you have another gear that transfers it to the next shaft, and so forth. They were used just like that rope to transfer power to different buildings along the road and up on the hillside. In these buildings, they had small machinery that needed power to run. But sometimes that machinery broke. and. Uh, this is an example of a breakage. And this is what this shop would do, repair this. Uh, this is a repair shop. A repair of old cast iron gears. This is the kind of metal they used before steel. Made from a mold. And you can see the what they call the teeth are broken on this. So. Alrighty. Uh, what I'm going to do today is show you uh, how these machines run and a little bit about what they would do. And uh, so we're going to start with what is called the lathe. We have three of them in the shop. Uh, lathes, these are from Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, they've been actually around since the, uh, not particularly this one, but metal lathes have been around here since the early 1700s to make metal parts. So. Uh, so, uh, some of the things in which the lady would do would uh, be the following. This piece right here is not actually part of the lady. It's part of a stock shaft that comes from the steel mill. And it's being held, if you, know, you can take a look underneath there and get an idea of what you would receive from the steel mill. That round, Round the uh, cylinder, uh, six foot long piece, and they would cut a piece off that, and this, they would put it in the chuck like a vise. This is a cutoff tool. This would take a slice off that, 
about this size to make a gear. Then they remove that and put this in place on it. So imagine that's no longer there. Um, next step would be to make a hole in the center. And that's done by a certain size drill bit. They would make the hole in there. And then the last step is done with this piece called uh, cutting head. It's located right on the machine right here. It's a piece that removes metal off the face of the piece like this or such as this right here. Some gears have a protrusion like that and it would remove this piece right here. Uh, so, uh, you get an idea of some of the things that the lathe would do. Uh, now I'm going to run the machine. When I run the machines, we have safety in the shop, which means this row of copper washers, and there's another row there. If you can stay between the two rows, that's our safety in the shop while we're running the machine. Okay. Okay, we have a bit of uh, chip coming off there. A little idea, you see it. So you get a little idea what the lane would do here. Okay, next machine, we were next here. This is called a shaper. And the cutting piece is right here. Going across this metal block here. The little chips coming off. See the action of the shaper going back and forth. One of the things the shaper could do was make a, what's called a keyway. Uh, this piece would be there instead of that. Cut a piece right there. This would be in the vise or chunk. Going back and forth, cutting out that, that keyway. How long would it take? Ah, uh, not that long. This would take long. Uh, but it would take, uh, if you want to know this process, which, which I'm explaining, back in the 1870s, it would take a, a week to do. So it's not something they would do here. I'll show you what they would do when you get down there. So the purpose of the keyway is there's a shaft that goes through here, and there's a piece of metal that goes it's jammed in there between the shaft and the gear, so they both turn at the same time. The purpose of the keyway. Okay, let's walk down further. Okay, this is a milling machine. What the milling machine does, it uh, cuts the channels between the, to make the teeth. Okay. Okay, I turn it on here. You can see the uh, thing moving, the uh, cutting piece moving. And this is the gear here. What do I do? I'll leave my, get my light here in a minute. Okay, there's uh, literally hundreds if not thousands of gears. Small end, a lot of teeth. It's called a ratchet gear. This is probably the piece that cuts it. And uh, it's a one-way gear, like a hand ratchet. Small, about the same size with small teeth. So, uh, in order to cut a particular gear, like this one, machines would have to refer to a chart to get the right one of these plates. They have holes in them. This is like a computer, this. 
uh, it's similar to the old mainframe computer index cards, similar to that. So, for example, if we're making this gear, the chart said that this is the plate to make this gear. You would put it on the machine right here. There's one there already. So, what happens basically to begin with? Uh, this piece would cut a channel to a certain depth. Now here's where the computer part comes in. This is a 19 tooth gear and uh, this plate cuts 14 through 20 teeth gears. So it would be the second row in from the edge that this piece with a metal pin sticks the pin into the second row in from the edge. Uh, and also what the chart says for 19 tooth gear is that the, this is called a crank moves twice around and a couple more of these sections. So keep your eye on the gear. This is where the computer part comes in. It's going to move to the next location to cut in other words. So once around, twice around, and a couple more locations and you're set up for the next location to cut. It's constantly doing that. This is where most of the time in making a gear is spent. Uh, like I mentioned, it would be about a week for a machinist to make a gear from start to finish. On our computerized machinery, it takes longer to load the software. Probably. <laughs> so here's what they actually did. This is repair work. This is what they did in the shop here. When one of these buildings brought in a gear to be repaired, this is a partial breakage. Uh, they drilled holes and put these bolts in the place of the tooth. It actually worked. It took about three hours in the 1870s. A more extensive repair work is where the whole tooth broke all the way across. They channeled it out with a shaper, put these plates in with screws. It took about twice as long. So that's the story on gears. I'll show you some other machinery here. Okay, this uh, is a two and a half inch drill press made right here in Wilmington, Delaware, 1869. We have another drill press right here. Uh, the interesting thing about this one is there's two combs up there with a leather belt between them. See the location of the belt between the combs. You hear the speed of the drill press presently. If I move that belt between the combs to the left, you hear it speed up. If I move it back to the right between the combs and the belt, it slows down. If I move back to the left, speeds up, back to the right, slows down. This is one of the first examples of variable speed of machinery. In other words, you can control the speed, change speeds. Uh, I understand they use this cone system in some of our modern day transmissions in our vehicles. It's called CDT. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's take a look at this piece right here. This is a teaching tool. It was first used at Harvard University to teach their engineering students all the variety of gears and how they work together. A lot of these gears have to do with your vehicles. Uh, you have uh, pinion, straight gear. 
rack and pinion steering in your car. These are cams and motor area. University, universal underneath. Uh, these are 90 degrees from each other, called mighty. Uh, this is a worm gear. Worm gear right here, this is a worm. This is that ratchet underneath. Ratchet gear. These are called crowns. Like King's crown. And we have a mortar and pestle standing here. That was the first way they mixed the ingredients to make gunpowder. If you go on the next uh, tour down to the mills, you'll see the present day or uh, what happened after they discontinued this. More dangerous than the rolling wheels. So, uh, a little bit about the employees. Uh, small shop, they probably didn't have any more than 12 people working in here. Uh, they may have had uh, two or three uh, apprentices. They were boys of age 14 in the 1870s. They were contracted by the company for four years to learn the trade here. Usually the son of a powder mill worker. And uh, if he made it through four years, well actually, I'll back up. He uh, was paid five cents an hour in the 1870s, but he didn't receive that. He only received half of that, two and a half cents an hour. And that was put into a bank account as an incentive to complete the four years. And if he did, he'd have money to buy tools for, for the shop here himself. And he could also rent a room on the property. At that time in the 1870s, it was about $17 a month to rent a room. Senior machinists, one of the best paying personnel in the whole yards, in the powder yards, $55 a month. That, that's a lot of money back there in the 1870s. So they worked 10 hour days here, six days a week. Nobody worked on Sundays, two, two holidays, 4th of July and Christmas. No vacations. <laughs> So, uh, any questions? Thank you all for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe.